16 and following it says, But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Moving down, it says, Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Read that again. It's better if you suffer. It's better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once and for all, for righteousness and for unrighteousness, but to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Flip real quick back to the ch uh, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. And it says, After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. What I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon is, is passion. What is your passion? Passion, if you look in the uh, Webster's Dictionary, says that passion is intense driving or overwhelming conviction. Passion is a strong liking or desire for or devotion to some activity, object, or concept. Passion is the sufferings of Christ from the Last Supper to his death on the cross. We're going to talk about passion today. And last year at this conference, there was many of y'all that were here even today that were touched mightily by, by, by the Thursday night session that Michael Rowan did. And one of our girls from Brownsville was one of those girls that was touched mightily. And uh, there's some neat things that happened in a lot of the schools in the Pensacola area this year. And um, I'm going to kind of bridge a little bit off this girl's testimony. Her name is Jennifer. And Jennifer Carroll, um, a couple years ago, came to, came to Pensacola, never really gone to a public school. She was, she was raised in a private school, went to an Assembly of God school back home. And when she came down here, um, the Lord just has a special hand upon this girl's life. And she was touched mightily in this conference, and the Lord began to do some things and burst some things within her. And right now, I just want you, if you would, to go ahead and give your attention to the screens and uh, let Jennifer just kind of share with you what the Lord was doing in her own words. Jeremy, if you would, go ahead and roll that tape, buddy. afterwards and I need and so love right and this cup that something so that I was going to give up. Rewind that, Jeremy, and start over again to get the sound right. Try that one more time, please. We're going to give that one more shot. I know the TV room is going to have it down just for us this time. Hallelujah. Don't you love it when everything works properly? Amen. Jeremy, go ahead and kill that, and I'll just share with you a little bit of what she's saying right there. Jennifer, after the conference last year, was so moved and touched that she shared the testimony afterwards that for the first time in her life, God began to break her and give her a burden and a passion for her school. For the first time in her life, God began to really show her that she had things in her life that weren't pleasing to God, that she had things in her life that were keeping her from fully sharing, telling others about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of those biggest things in her life was pride. 
that she had a problem with pride, and pride kept her from telling her friends about Jesus. See, she was worried about her reputation, worried what people would think if she fully sold out for God and began to tell them about Jesus. And she said that the Lord told her that he needs to remove that pride, to get that pride out of her life, and then let the, the, the gospel, the God that's in her, begin to come out. And as she began to do that, some incredible things began to happen. And about halfway through the school year, we had a service at Brownsville where Pastor Kilpatrick called up several of the students and just asked them to share some testimonies. And Jennifer got up and began to share the testimony of how, how the Lord had begun to, uh, at the conference last year, had broken her heart and began to, to plant a vision in her heart. And how now that she began to see some of that vision begin to materialize and that it was her responsibility, everybody else's, but her responsibility, more importantly, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with her friends because she saw her school dying and go to hell. She saw them literally in that state and that, that, she, that the Lord began to birth that within her, that she began to go out and begin to tell. She said for the first time in, in her life, she's beginning to see her friends beginning to come to the Lord. One by one, she said, but, but one or two or five, that's not enough. That's not enough. The Lord gave her the vision to see her school one for Jesus Christ. Not five of her friends, but hundreds of her friends. And as she began to share that, the whole service at church just took a turn. And God began to move, and it took over that whole service. You see, passion is what I'm talking about. Passion, the underlying Greek, if you look up the Greek for the word passion, it ties passion and sufferings together. As we read in the scripture a bit ago, the sufferings that Christ did. Have you ever wondered why they call the Easter play the Passion Play? Have you ever wondered that? They call the Easter play the Passion Play. And it's because of all the sufferings that Christ did for you. All the sufferings that he did. The sufferings that brought out the passion. See, if there wasn't a passion in him to do the things that he did, he never would have done the things that he did. I mean, look at all he did. He went through the, the scourging. Have you ever really heard what the scourging was all about? A cat of nine tails. A whip with nine strings coming out from it. On the end of each one of those lines was hard bone and metal and objects that would just literally cut into the flesh. And he suffered that for you. And he, the, 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 the Roman soldiers would bring, bring him in, and they, they hung him on this scourging post and stretched his body out. And the Roman soldiers that were trained on how to use this whip would literally be able to take the whip and flip it in such a way that it would wrap around the body. And it would dig into the flesh. And then he would turn it and twist it and pull it off of him at the same time. And when he pulled it off, it would literally rip the flesh off his body. And the theologians say that, that when he was on the, on the scourging post, that between 33 and 39 times, the soldiers would whip him with that, with that cat of nine tails. That means he's on there and he's hanging around and he wraps the whip around his body. And it literally wraps around and digs into the flesh. And then he pulls it off and rips the flesh off. And he does it again, and again, and again, and again, 33 to 39 times, each time opening up and ripping the literal flesh off the body. We've all seen these pretty pictures of Jesus hanging on the cross. Friend, let me tell you what, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, it was not a pretty picture. His body was torn up to the point that you probably couldn't hardly recognize it. It was ripped to shreds. When they took him off the scourging post, they took this robe and they put it back on him. And all the blood would soak into that robe. And by the time he got the cross to where they were going to crucify him, the blood had begun to dry into that robe. And they ripped the robe off of him again, opening up every single one of those wounds. And so it would start bleeding again. And he had the crown of thorns on his head that literally would go into his head and pierce and blood would stream down his face. No, it wasn't a pretty picture. It wasn't easy. He suffered for you and for me. What caused him to suffer like that? It was a passion. It was an overwhelming passion. Passion produces a willingness to suffer for a particular cause. It produces a willingness to suffer. It'll cause you to dry, it'll cause you to step out of your comfort zone. Passion will cause you to step out of a comfort zone. Friend, today there's little or no passion in the church. There's little or no passion in the church. The church has gotten so comfortable because there's a lack of passion. And because there's a lack of passion, friend, you know what? There's no power in the church. The church has gotten to where there's just, they do just enough to get by. We do good on Sunday. We do good on Wednesday. The rest of the week, though, there's no difference between the church and the world. You all heard the statistics that, that Brother Michael was, was uh, um, uh, giving you to this morning about the statistics of, of alcohol and drug abuse and teenage pregnancies. You know, the problem is, is there's not a lot of difference 
with those statistics between the church and the world. And friend, that's a shame. That's a shame when you can't tell the difference between the church and the world. That's a shame. See, there's no passion. And because there's no passion, there's no power. And because there's no power, you know what? We don't see the salvations anymore. We don't see the miracles happening today because there's no passion in the church where the church does just enough to get by. But you know what? We have our padded pews, don't we? We have our air conditioners. And the preachers, they drive nice cars. And all that's good. We look so good on the outside. But friend, on the inside, we're cold and we're dead. And there's no passion and there's no power. And when I, when I, when I hear the color passion, when I think about passion, I think of the color red, don't you? Hot. Hot is passion. Revelation 3 talks about, Revelation 3.15 talks about that the, the, the Lord said, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And when there's no passion in the church, the church, friend, has become lukewarm. We're a lukewarm church. It's just a fact. We are. You don't have to look far to see it. You can see the statistics, and they all prove it out. We're a lukewarm church. And the problem is, is because there is no passion. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but you're lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Most theologians will tell you that they believe that the, the seven churches that are talked about in the book of Revelation is a chronological order of the churches and that today we are living in the day of the church of Laodicea. And when I, when I think about lukewarm, it says that it'll spew you out of the mouth. You know, have you ever thought about what that really means? I remember when I was uh, in high school and, and we, we had a track meet that was out of town. It was a state track meet. And as we were coming back in, we all stopped off at this place called Mama Rosa's to get a pizza. And I remember there was five guys that didn't get pizzas like everybody else. They got hamburgers. And uh, the hamburgers tasted really good. They looked good. But on the way back home, these five guys began to get a little green. They, they were looking bad. And, and, and the longer we went, the worse they got. And before long, they're opening up the window on the bus. They're hanging their head out, and they are blowing major chunks. I mean, these kids are throwing up. They are so sick. They are so sick. You see, the hamburgers they ate were bad. The meat was bad. Everybody else was okay except for the kids that ate the hamburgers. And there's something about your body that when something gets inside your body that your body doesn't agree with, it will do anything to get it out. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, they kids ate the hamburgers. The hamburgers were bad, and the body literally just vomited it out. It will remove whatever that thing is from the body. And I think that's what Christ is talking about here. He says, if you're lukewarm, you're harmful to the body. If you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. If you're lukewarm, I will remove you from the body. That sounds pretty hard, doesn't it? But I think that's exactly what he's saying here. If you're lukewarm, you're harmful to me, you're harmful to the church. And if you're lukewarm, I'm going to remove you from the body. I'm going to remove you from the body. I believe that we're in a time today where the church is tired of dry, starchy religion. I believe that we are in a situation today where we're ready to begin to experience the passion of Jesus Christ again. I believe that. I've seen that with some of the kids. I believe that you want to see the power of God for yourself. I know that you're tired of hearing about the old stories. You're tired of seeing the stories from other people. You're tired of seeing what happened in the Old Testament and the New Testament. You want to know that the power of God that was there is still here today. Amen? I know that for a fact. And I've seen it happen over and over again. I've seen it happen. I know that the church today wants to see the power of God. I remember at Brownsville Assembly five years ago before the revival hit that we did not have a lot of salvations. We only had about a handful of salvations the year before the revival hit. That's just the truth. Today, five years later, we've seen hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people come to the Lord. But five years ago, that didn't happen at Brownsville. Something changed between then and now. Something changed. See, I remember at Brownsville when, 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 when the Holy Spirit fell. I remember the difference between the church. I remember that people that used to just come and sit on the pew began to get excited about the things of God. I saw them get excited and begin to go outside the church and begin to tell their friends and their neighbors and their co-workers and their relatives about what God was doing. And I saw our church go from a church that had very few salvations to seeing hundreds and hundreds of people come in, local people. I remember our youth group, we had about 80 to 100 kids before the revival hit. And after the revival hit, I remember so many of our kids would bring guests. Every week we had between 40 and 50 local guests visiting our youth group. What was the difference? 
The difference was our kids experienced the power of God. They got excited about it, and they began to get out of their comfort zone and go out and tell their friends and neighbors and bring them in. Amen? That's what we need to be getting. We need to get excited about the things of God. We need to get passionate about the things of God so that we'll begin to go out and be able to bring them in. The difference is the passion that was with them. The passion drove our kids out of their comfort zones where they look past themselves. They begin to step out in faith and begin to give something, give God something that he could bless. Amen? They began to do that. But we don't see the miracles in the church anymore. We don't see the miracles today because we've gotten so comfortable that we don't step out and let God use us. I'm going to tell you what, passion will drive you past yourself, young people. Passion will drive you past yourself where you're willing to step out of your comfort zone. You're willing to step out of the natural into the supernatural. That's what passion will do. Passion will drive you out of the natural where you begin to operate in the supernatural. And we need to operate in the supernatural, amen? I remember a service at Brownsville during one of our youth services about this section right over here. We saw three teenagers come in. And one of them was on a set of crutches. And we noticed they were different because they came in and they sat right down where everybody else was right in the middle of praise and worship. And after a little while, I forgot about them. But worship was incredible that night. God was moving incredibly. And after a little while longer, this one girl comes up at the platform, and she's grabbing hold of Brother Richard's pant leg, and she's pulling on it. Richard just kind of looks down and says, Can I help you, honey? And she's got tears in her eyes. She's squalling. And she, she goes, she goes, Sir, sir. Richard goes, yeah. She goes, sir. Richard says, what? Richard says, sir. This girl's moved. Richard goes, what? She says, sir, let me tell you. Me and my friends, we came into here to make fun of you guys. We heard about what was happening at this church. We heard about how your kids would, would, would fall out and how they shook and how when they were prayed for, they just laid on the ground. And, and we heard about all the things that was happening. And, and sir, we came here to make fun of you guys. But my friend over there, my friend, the one with the crutches when he came in, my friend, he, he a week ago was on the back of a pickup truck, and they were playing around doing 360s, and the truck flew off, and he flew off the back of the truck, and he shattered his knee. And the doctors told him it'd be six months before he could begin to rehab that knee. He said, but sir, look at him. And this kid's jumping up and down like this. Richard calls him up. He says, son, come here. Amen. He said, son, come here. He said, run up these steps. And the kid runs up the steps and he runs back down. He says, do it again. The kid runs up the steps and runs back down. Friend, let me tell you what. Those three kids came in to make fun of what God was doing. But the power of God fell on them. And they left that service that night believing, born again, Christians. Amen? Hallelujah. We need to get to the point, friend, where we begin to allow to God to do what he wants to do in our lives. Where we begin to open up ourselves, we begin to step out of ourselves, we begin to go past the natural and the supernatural and give God something to use, amen? That's what we need to do. What if on Father's Day, 1995, at 12 o'clock at Brownsville Assembly of God, if the church would have got up and left? What would have happened? Because I'm going to tell you what, it wasn't 12 o'clock when the power of God fell. It was somewhere around 1, 1 30 when the power of God showed up that morning, that afternoon. What if on Father's Day, 1995, the church would have said, 12 o'clock, roast is ready, got to go home. See, the church does that. We don't wait on God. We don't let God do what God wants to do. We do it on our time, on our principles, the way we want to do it. Friend, God has his way of doing things, amen? And we need to begin to let God do what he wants to do. I believe that we miss out on the supernatural because we lack a passion for the things of God. I, be, I believe we miss out on the supernatural because we're afraid to deny ourselves and begin to suffer for him. What if Peter had not gotten out of the boat in Mark 6, 45? What if Moses had never raised the rod and crossed the Red Sea? What if, what if Jesus had never said, as, as Brother Mike did this morning, Lazarus, come forth? What if that had never happened? What if Peter had never gotten up and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto thee in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. What if, what if all this had never happened? Friend, we'd have missed out on a lot of things. See, all these things right here to the natural eye looks impossible. 
But when we begin to step out in faith and get the passion of God take over and step out of our comfort zone and begin to let God do what God wants to do, friend, we're going to see the things begin to happen again. Amen? Amen? I believe it's time that we begin to let God do what he wants to do. It's that same passion that Jennifer Carroll has that, that we almost saw on the video. It's that same passion today, though, friend, that I believe that, that God wants this generation to capture. It's that passion I believe that God wants this generation to get a hold of and get the vision of. Because when that happens, then we're going to see our schools begin to change. Then we're going to begin to see the alcohol in our schools drop off, the drug addiction drop off, the suicide rates drop off, the pregnancies drop off. See, it's not going to happen, though, until we catch the vision of what God wants to do for us in the schools. But let me tell you also that passion's contagious. Passion is contagious. And some of us are not passionate about the right things. One of my favorite characters in the Winnie the Pooh cartoon is, is Eeyore. How many of y'all like Eeyore? <laughs> Eeyore's a character, isn't he? I mean, every time you see Eeyore, it's like, uh, oh, I'm just hanging around, having a bad day. Oh, the sky's still gray. I mean, Eeyore's passionate about those things, isn't he? I mean, but, and, and, and passion is contagious, whether it's good or bad. Passion is contagious. And I want to ask you today, what are you passionate for? Are you passionate for the things of God? Are you? Or are you passionate for pornography? Because see, whatever you're passionate for is what you're going to do. What do you do behind closed doors when nobody else is around? Do you pull out the remote control and start channel surfing? Or do you get a hold of God? What do you do? What are you passionate for? See, I know teenagers that are more passionate about talking to their friends on the computer than they are to talking to God about their friends. Because when we get passionate for the things of God, we're going to be concerned about our friends because God's concerned about our friends. I know kids that are so, are so, so passionate for sports. At certain times of the year, you might as well cancel church. Because if you have church, they're not going to show up. Because they're at home watching the Super Bowl. Or they're at home watching the NBA playoffs. That's just the truth, isn't it? Because they're more passionate about sports than they are about Jesus Christ. It's sad, but it's true. What are you passionate for? My sister-in-law, bless her heart, she, uh, she loves soap operas. And um, she has to work during the day. And she'll set the VCR every day to record her favorite soap operas while she's at work. So she comes home from work. What's the first thing she does? She plops down, flips on that VCR so she can watch her soap operas. See, she is so passionate for her favorite soap opera. That that's all she thinks about. It consumes her. See, when you're passionate for things, that passion will begin to consume you. That passion will consume you, regardless of what it's for. So I know some people that are so caught up in lust, they're so passionate in lust, they're so passionate in pornography that it consumes them. They, they go to school, and the only thing they can think about is not their work, but they think about the girl in front of them beginning dressing her with their eyes. They lay down at night to go to sleep, and they can't hardly sleep. They put their head on the pillow, and all these thoughts just consume their mind. It consumes them. See, they're more passionate about those things than they are about the things of God. Friend, we've got to get passionate about God again. We've got to get passionate about God again. And, and many of you out there, you're saying, well, well, why is he talking to us like this? We're here at the conference. We came all the way from who knows where to get here. We came from Mizzaloo, Montana. Yeah, we came from all over the place. How many of y'all travel more than two hours to get here? <laughs> Amen. How many of y'all travel more than three hours? Four hours? Five hours? Six hours? Nine hours? Ten hours? Twelve? Fifteen hours? Praise God. How many of y'all travel more than 20 hours? 24 hours? 48 hours? All right. Amen. And listen, I applaud you for that. We need, to, we need to get passionate and go after God. But let me caution you about this also. This week, 
does not determine your passion for God. What's happening at this conference this week does not determine your passion for Jesus Christ. What determines it is next week. It's next month. It's when school starts back up. It's next year. It's what are you doing a year and a half from now. Friend, that's your passion for God. Amen? It's what you do then. Do you still get up early and read the Bible? Do you still get up early and pray? Do you still have a passion for your friends? Are you still broken for them? Friend, that's where your passion comes in. It's not this week. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to take just a couple minutes, and I'm going to go over some, some nuts and bolts things that we can do when you get back home in your schools. Real quick, a show of hands. How many of y'all are in public schools? Praise God. How many of your public schools are totally on fire for Jesus Christ? That's what I thought. Hey Amen. There's some things that we can do in the schools that will help make our schools a little bit better. One thing I would like to encourage you about, first of all, I want to challenge each one of you in five ways. Every single one of you in this room, I want to challenge you five ways right off the bat. Make that six ways. First of all, those of you that are hot and on fire for God, I want to challenge you to wear Christian t-shirts to school. Amen. I want to challenge you to wear a Christian t-shirt. Now listen, if you're the kid that goes to parties on Friday nights that tells the dirty jokes, don't wear the t-shirts. Amen? If that's you, don't wear it. Do us all a favor. Leave the shirt at home. Better yet, give it to someone else who loves God. Because if that's you, you do the rest of them a disservice. And we don't want you wearing a Christian t-shirt. That's just the truth. If it hurts, say, oh me, and get over it. Amen? Amen? Listen, I challenge you to wear a Christian t-shirt to school. Be marked as a Christian. And if you got your Christian t-shirt at school, you know what you might as well do? You might as well go ahead, you might as well go ahead and, uh, and take your Bible with you. Amen? Take your Bible. Not inside your backpack. Not underneath your books. Carry the Bible on top of your books. Amen. And you know what? You're wearing the Christian t-shirt. You're carrying the Bible. You know what you ought to do? Just go ahead and read it. Read your Bible. Your friends have no problem reading romance novels in front of you. Why should you have a problem reading God's romance novel in front of them? Amen? Read your Bible. You got your t-shirt on, you're carrying your Bible, you're reading it. What you ought to do now is make sure you pray in the lunchroom. Pray in the lunchroom. You say, I can't do that. Listen, if you're eating lunchroom food, you better be praying. Amen? I go to the school several times a week, friend. We need to eat the lunch. We need to pray if we're eating that lunchroom food. And don't, don't pray like so many adults pray when they go to a restaurant. You ever watch adults pray at restaurants? Man, they're so phony sometimes. I mean, they'll drop a napkin on the floor and say, Father, bless the bill in Jesus' name, amen. Think about it. Don't pray like that. Don't do that, okay? Listen, pray. You got the table there. Look at them and say, hey, look, y'all are eating cafeteria food too. Let me pray over your meal also, okay? And then pray. Pray over their meal. Father, God, in the name of Jesus, bless this meal today. We need to pray. Wear your Christian t-shirt. Carry your Bible. Read your Bible. Pray. I want, and the and, and next thing I want to do is encourage you to get involved in the Christian clubs on your schools. Be a part of the Christian club on your school. There's so many, there's so many Christians out there that try to make it all by themselves. And let me tell you what, you can't make it all by yourself. You need friends, you need supporters, you need accountability. And if you get involved in the Christian clubs, that gives you a resource, a source of other students that, that at least give the appearance of loving God. Amen? Get involved in the Christian schools. And if there's, not a, if there's not a Christian, I'm sorry, get involved in the Christian clubs. If there's not a Christian club at your school, make an effort to start one. Because the Constitution of America gives you every right to begin a Christian club on your school. They can't say anything about it. The, the 1984, Ronald Reagan signed into law, into the Constitution, an Equal Access Act that gives you, the students in the American public school system, the right to have public um, Christian clubs on the campuses. Amen? You have the right to do that. And listen, when you, when you get in that club, don't let that club be one of these encourage me clubs. We need encouragement clubs, don't get me wrong, but so many of the clubs are so watered down and wishy-washy, I wouldn't want anything to do with them. Amen? Make that an evangelical club. 
A club that its sole purpose is to reach outside the four walls of the classroom and touch the school for Jesus Christ. Amen. We need clubs like that. And there's several organizations that are out there that will help you do that. There's an organization called First Priority. First Priorities, amen. I love First Priority. It's available all over the United States. There's tons of resources out there to help you get it. And if you're interested in getting some information, jot this phone number down. First Priority, it's 1-800-895-5339. 800-895-5339. Five three three nine. They've got a couple manuals out there. It's called the How Manual, H O W, and it's designed to help you get an idea and understanding of how to start a Christian club in your school. It gives you resources to do that. There's another organization called Youth Alive. Youth Alive is incredible. It was started by the Assemblies years ago, and now it's an interdenominational organization. It's the sister organization with First Priority. They work hand in hand together. And to get some information from there, one eight hundred. 545-2766. That's 800 545 2766. They've got a manual out called Take a Stand. It's 120 pages, and it's one of the best manuals that's out there to help you, the student in the school, know and understand how to start and maintain and uh, strategies to evangelize your school for Jesus Christ. I encourage you to get, get hold of those materials, and they'll help you. They'll help you. So, wear a Christian t shirt. Carry your Bible, read your Bible, pray, get involved in the Christian clubs. Friend, if you're doing all those things, you know what? There's people out there going to begin to ask you a lot of questions. And when they ask you the questions, you know what you need to do? Answer them. Because you have the only answer for them. You do. You have the only answer for them. And I want to ask you, how long are we going to sit around and watch our friends get involved in the things they get involved in? You know, we hear about the shootings at Columbine, and, and, and like Brother Mike shared this morning, the 12 shootings that the media hasn't even talked about since the Columbine issue. We hear about all these things in the paper, and, 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 and it grieves us for a little while. But you know what? You, you, a lot of times we sit there and we say, you know, that's over there. That's not here. My school's not like that. My school doesn't have that kind of a problem. Thank God it doesn't have that kind of problem. But how many of your schools have problems with your friends getting involved in alcohol? How many of your schools, how many of your schools, how many of your friends are involved right now in doing illegal drugs? How many of y'all have friends right now that are involved in sexual activity outside the design of God? How many of your friends do you know last year and this year that have gotten pregnant? How many of them have had teenage abortions? How many of your friends right now today are thinking about committing suicide? You know, it's not just about the shootings that we hear about. But it's the things that we battle with day in and day out that's going into every single one of our schools. And every one of you have friends that are involved in each one of those activities I just talked about. I know you do. Because I go to the schools all the time, and they're out there. I see it. And it breaks my heart because there's very few students that have the passion to stand up and say, hey, I'm going to make a difference. There's not enough students that are willing to do that. Why? Because they lack the passion for the things of God. Because that passion will drive you out of your comfort zone. It will drive you past the natural into the supernatural. Friend, we're talking about getting passionate for the things of God. And a lot of times, you know what it is? Some of times it's, our, it's the youth pastor's fault. It really is. Because we're real good about giving you a, an upbeat, high-energy message right at the beginning of school to go out and win and take your school for Jesus Christ. And you do. You get so fired up. You get pumped up. And you go out there for a week, for two weeks, for three weeks. And pretty soon you begin to get beat up a little bit. You begin to wear down. You get discouraged. But you don't hear another message like that for another year. And before long, you quit and you just give up. Friend, that's another reason why we need to get involved in these Christian clubs. It's because there's a continual source of people coming in to encourage you and to pump you up and to help keep you going after the things of God. Amen? We need to continually be upbeat like that. A lot of the, a lot of the um, churches that I know of today have started campus missionary programs. Youth Alive has some great material for a campus missionary program. And it's a program very simply designed to send you guys out from your church as missionaries to your schools. How many of you all know that the missionary, the biggest, the largest missionary field in America today is the public school system? The number one missionary field today is in the public schools, where 88% of the kids that go to school do not go to church. And those that do aren't going after God. You know what I'm talking about? 88% of the kids in the public schools are not church-based kids. And it's a shame because 85% of the people become Christians. 
will become Christians before they ever graduate from high school. And once they graduate from high school, they move off, they get away from the influences of their childhood, and the chance of them ever becoming Christians drops down dramatically. If you don't reach your friends before they graduate from high school, chances are that your friends will never be reached for the kingdom of God. Yeah, you have a responsibility. It's up to you. It's up to you to see that they come to the Lord. Amen? Amen. The campus missionary program, though, what it does, is it, 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 it commissions you as, as students from the church going out in the mission field of your schools. And, and, and it, it helps us to hold you guys accountable. It puts the accountability on us to hold you accountable. And we all need that accountability. But by doing that, though, you're committing to begin to pray for your school daily. Not just for your school, but for your students at the school, for your friends, for the hard cases, for the teachers, for the faculty. Pray for favor in the school. Begin to pray daily for that. You're also going to commit to, to discipleship. In other words, going after God. You're going to commit to being um, um, missionaries. You're going to commit to mission offerings and, and understanding that missions is not just overseas work. Missions is local. Some of you say that you want to be missionaries, you want to go on mission trips. You want to, you want to raise up money for the summer and you want to go to, to Africa, or you want to go to, to Mexico, or you want to go to, to Guyana or wherever on a missionary trip. And you won't even talk to the person in the line at McDonald's. You're not even concerned enough about the clerk at Walmart. You're not even concerned enough about the student that sits in front of you in your own school. But yet you want to go over there and be a missionary. Friend, I tell you what, we need missionaries here in America. We need you guys to step up and say, hey, I want to be a missionary in my school. Amen? Amen? Because that's where it's at. And if you're not faithful to do that here, how is God going to use you there? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> I know that plans, though, and these are plans, these are strategies. All these things in the schools, they're strategies. And see, I know that these plans and these strategies, though, if they don't have passion, there's not going to be any power to it. The best made plans sometimes don't pass. They don't work because there's no power to them. Amen? And we can have the best plan. We can have the best school program. But if there's not a passionate teenager to lead that program, you know what? That program's not going to work. If we don't have a passionate teenager to stand up and lead that club, that club's never going to get off the ground. We need you guys to step up and become passionate about the things of God to go out and touch your school for Jesus Christ. Amen? We need you guys to do it. It's not going to happen without you. It's not going to happen without you. It all starts with you. And I want to tell you also that when you start these Christian clubs in your schools, do me a favor. Don't let them become de um, democracies. Don't, don't let them become dictatorships. I'm sorry. Have you ever been to a Christian club, ever been somewhere, and the same person gets up and speaks every single week for 15 or 20 minutes, and it's the most boring thing you've ever heard in your life? And it starts off with 75 people, and by the end of the school year, you got seven. And you ask yourself, well, why is the club dying? Part of the problem is because you're not doing anything. And nobody wants, wants to get up early in the morning. And our clubs here, they start early. Our schools take in at 7.15, the first bell rings. That means that our clubs start at 6.45 in the morning. So you got to get up early to go to the Christian clubs here. And you know what? I don't want to get up early, that early, to go to a club that doesn't do anything. Hey, Amen. You know what I'm talking about? Has anybody ever been there? I mean, that, that, that's so boring. Don't make your club a dictatorship. Make it work out different. That's one of the things I love about the strategy of the first priority and the youth of lives. See, this first priority strategy has a four-week cycle. It works on a cycle of four weeks. Each week, you're doing something different. The very first week is what they call the, uh, the um, accountability week. We all need accountability. And what we do is we'll take small groups. We'll divide the club up into small groups, and we'll begin to hold each other accountable. And we'll begin to ask some things. Hey, what's going on in your youth group? How many of y'all know that not every kid in your school that goes to church is involved in an active, strong youth group? They don't get strong teaching and good teaching. So the accountability we can help in that area as well. You go into a solid youth group. Your friend's got a solid youth group, but the guy across the table from you doesn't. And you sit there and you say, hey, well, look, this is what we're talking about. You know, he's talking about this. What are y'all doing? So you can share about what's going on in your youth group. And you begin to get, as you begin to build those relationships, you get down and dirty. You get to share the, the nitty-gritty things. 
You see, even I right now, I have people in my life that hold me accountable. Because there's things that I'm not proud of that I know I'm subject to falling in. And I have people that hold me accountable. And we ask the tough questions. Amen. We need people in our lives to ask us the tough questions. So the first week is geared towards accountability. You get a small group of people who are going to hold you accountable in that school. The second week is the challenge week. The challenge week, you'll bring a guest speaker in, maybe a youth pastor, a teacher, a student, somebody with a, an evangelical anointing upon them that will be able to come in and tell the students and challenge the students to be bolder in their walk, challenge them to go out and tell their friends about Christ, challenge them in certain areas. And the third week's the testimony week. You have the students share testimonies of what God's doing in their lives, in their youth groups, and in their churches. See, we need to hear the testimonies of others because that encourages us. And the fourth week is what every other week leads up to. It's called Seek Week. And the Seek Week is where the students will go out and all their friends, their lost friends, to come into the, come into the meeting and, uh, and, and bring someone in to share the gospel with them. And you can do a lot of neat ways to, to encourage the students to bring in their lost friends. You, one thing we do in, in here is we've got a deal with McDonald's where McDonald's supplies um, sausage biscuits for us on our Seek Week. You know, sometimes you can't get your friend to come listen to the gospel, but they'll come in for a breakfast in the morning. Amen? And we use that bait, and we'll go out and we'll, we'll invite the football team. We'll go out and we'll tell the football team, hey, look, we got a meeting in your honor. Or we'll go out and we'll serve them Gatorade at practice with a personal invitation to come out for breakfast the next day at the Seek Week. And, and at some of the schools, we've had, we've had entire teams come out. At Washington High School, we invited the soccer team. And the, we had 35 players of the soccer team come into one of the meetings. And we bring a youth pastor in to share the gospel. And we've had meetings where we've had 9, 10, 15, 20 players off the local teams give their hearts to Jesus Christ at these Seek Weeks. Amen? Amen. That's exciting. That's exciting because these are kids that won't go to church. But they'll come into a meeting for breakfast in the morning and give them the gospel. See, we need clubs that will do things different. They won't do the same thing week in and week out. And then those kids that got saved and came for that, that Seek Week, you know what you do the very next week? It's accountability week. You plug them into an accountability group. See, now then, they get plugged into a, a group at school that will hold them accountable. But since we have a network of youth pastors that help support these clubs, the youth pastors take these kids and they plug them into local churches throughout the, throughout the Pensacola area. So they get plugged into church, they get plugged into school. You know, the chances of that kid surviving in his Christian walk have just greatly increased. You know what I mean? Because it's not enough to make a decision to serve God and to come down to an altar and get up and go back and do the same things you always did. See, we need to find a way to follow up on these students to give their heart decisions. When you get back to, many, many of y'all last night made decisions to go after God like you never had before. And you know what? If you just got up from your seat and you went back to your pew and, and nothing else happens, that decision means absolutely nothing. But if you go back and you begin to put that decision into action, that means something. See, it's not enough to come down and just give your heart to God if you don't do anything else. Man, you've got to give your heart to God, but then you've got to get people in your life that will hold you accountable. You've got to get plugged in. You've got to become an effective minister for Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what it's all about. It's not just enough of making a decision, but it all starts with you. It all starts with you. Last year, I was sharing the story about Jennifer Carroll. And at the rally, or another thing that we do is we do these rallies at the end of the year. And on these rallies, we'll do them at the high school. And we'll do it like in the gymnasium. And at Scambia High School, at the end of last year, we did one of these rallies. And what we'll do is we'll take a, maybe a, a rap group to come in, a Christian rap artist, and, and just to, to help bring in the group. And, and we'll, we'll bring a local band in and, and maybe just do some, uh, some praise and worship music. And then we have the students share testimonies at these rallies of what God's done in their life. I mean, the week before that, the students will go out and they'll be passing out flyers and invite all their friends into the rally. And Jennifer, she had such a heart last year at this conference that God gave her such a burden for her school. And I think they came up and showed me a note. And I just want you to see what happened at her school when we did this rally at her school. If you all would go ahead and run that video. You all pray with me that it works this time, okay? Sound the alarm, gather the people. Gather the elders, let the ministers win. God, take back the years that the enemy stolen. Lord, you are coming. Oh my God. Holy now it's time to decide. 
what I'm going to ask you guys to do is for those of you who've never accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, maybe it was just all a story, it was, you know, the only Christians you saw were hypocrites, so you didn't need any of that. You need him in your life today. You need to let him be Lord of your life because the forgiveness comes. He can wash away everything that you've ever done. He washes it away and you become new in him. And I know that God is working on some of your hearts right now. I know. And I just ask you that if, if God, if you can feel that in your heart, if, if, you, if anything that's been said tonight, and it's not the words that we're saying, it's the Holy Spirit trying to speak to you guys. He's trying to get a hold of you guys because he loves you so much. And he longs for you to be in fellowship with him. And so there's some of you here tonight that have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. And I'm not going to let another day go by without opening up the opportunity for you to do that. But beyond that, there's some of you that have been in church for a real long time. And the story of Jesus Christ became like a fairy tale. It was a story, and yeah, it's moving, and oh, that's touching. But it didn't really guide your everyday life. It didn't affect the way you guys walked every day. Guys, you can, you can, you can renew that. Make the commitment today to let that be real in your life. Ask him to come and just to be real to each and every one of you guys. And right now, I know we're all at school and all of our friends are watching. But if any of this has touched your heart, guys, if what you saw up here was really for real and you know that you need that, whether you've never had it or whether you've been in church your whole life and it's not really real, I want to ask you guys to just come up here right now, get out of your seats and come stand up here and we're going to pray. Oh my Lord, your return be like you. Guys, if God is speaking to your heart, this Lord, you long to pour to out your spirit, your sons and your daughters be like you. Lord, you long to pour out your spirit, your sons and your daughters be dead. I want everybody here to turn to your neighbor and ask you the one question. Do you need forgiveness tonight for Jesus? And if you do, I want you to come here right now. Everybody ask your neighbor. Let's go. Oh, my Lord, you're returning. We lie here weeping. Between porch and altar, we pour out your spirit on your sons and your daughters. We lie here weeping. Between porch and altar, Pour out your spirit on your sons and your daughters. We lie here weeping between porch and altar. Pour out your spirit on your sons and your daughters. We lie here weeping between porch and altar. Amen. That started with one person's vision, one person's passion that God burned at this conference last year. Where it began to grow and grow as the year went on. And finally, a couple weeks before the school year ended, they had a rally at the school where over 700 students from a local high school came out to that rally. And you saw the results. Over 350 teenagers gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. Amen. It started with the passion of one girl. Don't say that you can't make a difference, friend. You can make a difference. 
God needs you to begin to get a passion for him and to step out of your comfort zone and go in the schools so that you, you can affect your friends for Jesus Christ. But let me tell you what. Jennifer Carroll could not have done what she did and stood in front of her friends and shared the testimony that she shared and talked like she talked if she went to school and lived like everybody else. She could not have done that if she went out to the parties on Friday nights. She could not have done that if she took part of the jokes that they told. If she didn't live a life of holiness in front of her friends, her friends never would have accepted what she had to tell them at that rally. But because she lived the life, she had the privilege of being able to stand up in front of them and tell them what she told them. And God used that and honored that. And she saw 350 of her peers come down and accept Jesus Christ. Hey Amen. Listen, it all begins with you. And you know what? If nobody knows what your passion is, you probably don't have a passion. Do your friends know what your passion is? If we went out to your neighborhood today and we knocked on your neighbor's door and we asked them, hey, do you know Billy next door? Do you know Johnny next door? Yeah, yeah. Well, what's he about? Well, man, he loves sports. He's an athlete. Anything else? Well, um, he, he, he likes to watch you know, music videos on TV. Well, what else about him? Would they even know that you're a Christian? Would they know that you go to church? Would they know that you're on fire for God? See, what is your passion? Because whatever your passion is, people know it. When you're passionate for something, people will know it. If they walk up to Jennifer Carroll, you can't spend five minutes talking to that girl and, her, and, and not understand that she's passionate for God. If they walk up and talk to you for five minutes, would they even know that you're a Christian? See, what is your passion? If nobody knows what your passion is, you probably don't have a passion. Amen? It's just the truth. Do your neighbors know? Do your coworkers? Do your classmates? You see, revival, revival has always began with the person. It always starts with the person. And it generally begins with a message of holiness. Have you studied revivals throughout history? Almost every revival began with the message of holiness. A message of holiness. Brother Mike talked about it this morning. Holiness is what leads to revival. It's the holiness that leads to revival. As you get your life right and you get passionate for God, see that holiness begins to come out of your lifestyle, begins to come out of your mouth. People see that. They respect that. They honor that. God honors that. And every time after the holiness goes out and people begin to get holy, that's when God adds the Pentecost. That's when the revival comes. Amen? Amen? But it begins with you. What is your passion? Do your friends even know that you're a Christian? Do they? Some of us do just enough to get by. Many of you in this room right now, you're doing just enough to get by. And maybe you do just enough to get by, and one day, one day you make it into heaven. And you're sitting there at the Lord's Supper. And it's an incredible setting. The table's set. You see Jesus down on the end. And you're sitting across the table from this little girl. And she looks at you and she says, sir, ma'am, what did you do for Jesus? What did you do for Jesus? What are you going to tell her? I went to that conference in Pensacola, Florida. I went to church on Wednesday. I sang in the youth choir. I went to church every Sunday. I, I had a string of 59 Sundays in a row, and I didn't miss Yeah, but what'd you do for Jesus? And you bow your head because you know you really haven't done anything for him. It's all been selfish. And then all of a sudden you look up and you say, well, what'd you do? And she says, well, my name's Cassie. And I went to school one day. See, all my friends knew that I was a Christian. I got passionate for him and I began to tell my friends about it, and there were some guys that, that knew about my passion for God. And they didn't like it a whole lot. And then one day they came to school, and they had their guns. And they were shooting up the school, and finally they came to me, and they looked at me, and, and they said, Cassie, as they held the gun to my head, they said, Cassie, do you still believe in Jesus? She said, yes, I do. And they blew me away. I gave my life for Jesus. And all you did was go to church. Friend, I hope that never happens to you. I hope that never happens to you. 
But I'm afraid so often that's the case with the average American teenager today. But friend, I'll tell you what. I think it's time that the church stand up and it no longer becomes average, amen? I believe that it's time that we begin to stand up and we begin to go out and we begin to take back what the devil has taken. We begin to stand up and we begin to exalt the name of Jesus Christ in the schools again. We need to begin to stand up and begin to share our testimony and our faith and our love for God again. It's time that America goes back to its Christian roots again. And it's going to begin with you, the teenagers, the youth of this generation. You're the ones that are going to be able to make a major difference. Amen? You're the ones that can do it. 85% of the people who become Christians become Christians before they graduate from high school. Wouldn't it be awesome if 85% of the kids that graduated from high school were Christians? Amen? That's what I want to see. I want to see that day where you bow your head in the lunchroom to pray, and the Holy Spirit moves in and falls in that place and begins to shake your friends for Jesus Christ. That's what I want to see. I want to see the schools taken back for God. Amen? And it begins with you. One person that's passionate for the things of God can dramatically affect their school. Jennifer Carroll, Jennifer, come up here. Jennifer Carroll, this girl got a passion for God last year. A passion and a burden like she's never had before. And she began to let that burden and that passion rise up inside of her. And God began to plant in her heart a burden for her school to see her school one for Christ. For I'll tell you what, Jennifer's just an average teenager. The only difference is that she totally loves God. And she's not worried about what other people think about her. How many of y'all can say, I totally love God and I don't care what anybody thinks about me? I'm not going to let pride get in the way. I'm going to go after God like I've never gone after God, and I'm going to tell my friends about it. Why? Because if I don't, they're going to hell. And I have the ability and I have the thing to give to them that will keep them out of hell, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen? And right now, I want everybody in this room to bow your heads for just a moment. And I want you to search your hearts right now. What is your passion? Do your friends know what your passion is? Do your neighbors, do your classmates? Are you really a Christian? Or do you just like going to conferences? Nobody's looking around. I'm just asking you to ask yourself these questions. Am I really willing to make a difference in my school? Do I really want to see God move in my school? Am I willing to take a risk that I might not be popular? Am I willing to suffer for the passion of Jesus Christ? He suffered for you. Are you willing to suffer for him? Are you willing to step out of your comfort zones and give God something he can bless? Are you willing to step out of your comfort zone and let God use you? Because that's all he's looking for. He's looking for someone that's willing to say, God, use me. Put the coal to my list. Brand my heart with your fire, God, and let me go and tell my friends about you. That's what he's looking for. That's what he's looking for. Most of you are here with youth groups. Most of you are here with your friends. And I'm going to ask you, I'm not going to call you out to come forward or anything like that. But I'm going to ask you to make a gut decision. A decision that God and your friends are all watching. Because I want them to hold you accountable. Because if you stand up in just a minute when I ask you to, I want your friends to hold you accountable. I'm going to ask you in just a minute, if you're willing to step out this next year in your school and make a difference, if you're willing to step out and say, I don't care what others think about me. I don't care what I look like. I don't care how many times I, I, I get laughed at. I don't care. And you're willing to just drop your pride issue. And you're willing to say, God, I want you to be lifted up. Jesus, I want you to be lifted up. I want you to use me. God, I want you to use me. If that's you, with your friends watching, with God watching, I want you right now to stand up. If you're not willing, I'm serious, if you're not willing, I don't want you to stand up. Because what I want to see is some world changers. See, God's looking for world changers. God's looking for history makers. He's looking for people that are willing to make a difference, no matter what the cost. No matter what the cost. 
He's looking for teenagers, men and women that will get passionate for the things of God. And if you're not willing to do that, don't stand up. Go ahead and sit back down. Friends, I want you to look around and see who's standing. From your youth group, I want you to look around and see who's standing. I want, I want them to be counting the cost right now because I want you to be able to hold them accountable. I want you next year to look at them and say, hey, look, you're doing what you said you're doing. Hold them accountable. Or when they start cowering down, hey, come along beside them and encourage them and lift them up. Say, hey, listen, you remember that conference? You made a decision. Come on, come on, let's go. Because we need to do that with each other. I'm not saying you look around to put them down. I'm telling you look around because you need to encourage them. Because there's going to be times when it gets hard. There's going to be times when it gets rough. And there's going to be times they want to give up. And that's when they need you to come beside them and say, hey, come on, we can make this together. We can make it together. And pull them on. And pull them on. All those are standing right now. I want Jennifer to come here. This is Jennifer. She's one of my heroes. I love Jennifer. Listen, Jennifer is no different than any other teenager in America today. What she did was stood out in faith and gave God something to bless. And she saw some neat things happen in her school this last year. And if you're willing to step out in faith, lay down your pride, and give God something to bless, you're going to see some neat things happen this year as well. And right now, I'm going to ask Jennifer, I want her to pray for you guys. And I'm going to come back and we're going to close out. But I want Jennifer to pray for you guys. And listen, all you guys that are standing, all you ladies that are standing, I want you just to go ahead and, and just reach your hands out and just receive what the Lord's going to be speaking to you as Jennifer prays, okay? You all speak, stick your hands out right now. Jennifer, go ahead and pray. Whatever's on your heart, sis. All right, before I pray, you guys, I just want to say something really quick. Um, so many of you have come to conferences before, you've come to things before, and you've heard You've heard this religious language about how we're going to go out and we're going we're gonna to see our world touched with Jesus Christ. You've all heard it. And I know that so many of you have all come and you said, yeah, I'm going to be real. I'm going to touch my world for Jesus Christ. And you go out and that passion isn't there when you're in front of those people. When you walk the halls at school, that, that passion, the way that you can cry out in church isn't there. When it really matters, when it's really time to step out, you just don't feel that. You have to allow God to really brand your heart. It's not just a little logo and words that they chose for the conference. That was my prayer. Those were the very words that I prayed that night at the youth conference when God changed my heart. Because I said, God, I can pray here at the youth conference and I can get on my face and I can cry out for lost souls, but why is it when I walk the halls with those lost souls that I don't feel this burden? I said, God, you've got to brand something in me that stays, guys, and let him brand it long enough that it never, never goes away, just like Brother Richard talked about last night. Allow him to completely brand your heart, because I promise you that even half of you that stood to your feet today, really, if you would really get sold out, allow God to brand your heart and go into your schools, go into your workplace, go into wherever you are with a fire and a passion from the heart of Almighty God. We serve the Almighty God who has no limitations except the ones that we put on Him. And if half of you would go out with that kind of passion, with, with just a desire to really see Him move and press in until He does it, we could see this nation change. We would see our public schools different, and it would happen. It's all about you. Don't wait for your youth pastor to do it. It's time for this generation to step yeah. up and do it. Amen. All right, everybody, just lift your hands. We're going to pray. God, I come humbly before you, God. Lord, so unworthy of who you are. God, and as imperfect, God, and normal as anyone else in this room, Jesus. But I come before you with a cry, God. Lord, that you would touch our hearts so greatly, God. Lord, that you would brand us with a passion and a burden, Lord, for those around us, God. Lord, for our classmates, God. For the kids that we walk every day with, God, that have no idea the truth and reality of Jesus Christ inside our lives, God. 
Lord, for those who walk daily beside us, God, Lord, that if they were to die, they would spend eternity in hell, Jesus. God, let that reality truly grip our hearts, Lord Jesus. God, I pray that you would change something in the lives, God, of those that truly mean what they said, God, those that stood to their feet, God, and have a hunger, God, Lord, that they meant it when they said that they wanted to live differently, that they wanted that passion, God. Lord, it's not something we can work up. It's not something, God, that we can just talk about. The church has talked about it for years, God. It's time for you to ignite something within us, Lord. God, I pray that you would do that work in each and every life, God, as these hands are raised, Jesus. God, that your fire would come down and it would ignite something within, God. Lord, something within the depths of their souls, Jesus. God, that, Lord, that they would, that as you put that branding iron, Lord, to their hearts, Jesus. God, that you would help us, God, that you would give us the endurance and the strength to stick to it, God, to stay through it, whatever, whatever it takes, Lord, to get to that place, God, where we can be branded, Lord God, with a passion from you, Jesus. God, that we would go out, Lord, and change our world, Jesus. Lord God, that you would just instill, God, and birth, Lord, something new, Jesus. God, that we wouldn't be just content anymore with the things in church that we've seen, God. Lord, that as young people, God, as the youth of this generation, God, not only of this nation, Lord, of this world, God, Lord, that you would just instill within us, God, a passion that stands up, God, and wants more than what we've seen, wants more than what we know, God, that's sick and tired of what's happening in our public schools, that's sick and tired of what's happening in our world, God, that's sick and tired of darkness ruling over these areas, Jesus, that will stand and believe for you to come in, for you to move, God, for you to pour out your spirit like you said you would in the last days. Lord, that you would begin to birth that vision and that passion, Lord, in each and every heart here today, Jesus. And that they would go from here, God, and that it wouldn't just disappear after this week, God. Lord, that you would burn it so intensely within them, God, that it becomes the thing that they strive for in prayer, God. Lord, that they would seek you, Lord God, until you give them a vision, Jesus. Give them a vision beyond what they know, God, what human eyes would say is enough, Jesus. God, give them a heavenly vision, Jesus, because there's so much more that you can do. Lord, and that they would grasp hold of that and that they wouldn't let go and say that until they see it come through, Jesus. God, that they would pray that thing through, God, that you would teach them to begin to step out in faith, Jesus. Lord, and when we do that, God, when we totally commit our lives to you, Jesus. Lord, Lord, and we pray and we seek for that vision, Lord. God, that you would give us a passion, Lord and that you would change this world. God, that you would change this world, God, that you would raise up that generation of young people. God, that wholly seeks after you. Lord, that's passionate about you. God, that's willing to die for you. I just thank you and praise you. In your name I pray, amen. amen, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Before we dismiss, I think Laura Hill is going to come make a couple announcements. Before we dismiss, those that stood up, let me, let me encourage you in a couple things. First of all, don't let things distract you. Because you're making a quality decision right now that you're going to go after God like you never had before that you can tell your friends. Relationships can distract you. Be careful the things you allow to get into your life. Be careful the friendships that you make. The boyfriend-girlfriend relationships can drag that passion out of you. How many of you all have known a teenager hot and on fire for God? until they get a boyfriend or girlfriend. Listen, be careful, be choosy, be, be, pick quality relationships, ones that will encourage you and help you, not drag you down. Amen? Amen? Father God, I thank you for this time with these people, Lord. And God, I ask you right now, Father, each one that stood, burn within their heart, God, the conviction, God, that they're going to make a difference. A conviction, God, to see their friends, one, for you, Lord. God, I ask you right now, Jesus, Give each one of them the, the boldness to step out like they never have before. God, to step out of their comfort zone. God, to step out of the natural. And Lord Jesus, step into the supernatural to give you something to bless. I want everybody in here right now to repeat this after me. Everybody that stood up, everybody that made that decision, repeat this after me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I want you to use me. I want to be a history maker for you. Not for my glory. I don't deserve the glory but for your glory. Jesus, I ask you right now, put a burden in my heart for my friends. Put a burden in my heart for my school. Burn it within me. 
Sear my heart. Brand it. Go deep. Jesus, I want to see you touch my school this year. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.